In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with the true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave me. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy
good thing. Grant us your grace and keep your commandments, that we may please you in both will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. 
But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Abraham and his wife Sarah, they were really old. And they were really starting to wonder and doubt, how can God keep his promise? Because we're too old to have kids. And it's been a long time since God even told us that we would have children. And so God reminded Abraham again of his promise. And he said, come outside. And it, it was nighttime. He said, come outside and look up. And what did Abraham see at night? He saw stars. Right? And God said, none of the stars. Count how many are there. You guys ever tried to count how many stars there are? No. Yeah. It's, it's really impossible, actually. Because there's so many you can't keep track. You can't even see all of them that are up there. But God says, count them if you can. That's how many of your children are going to count. You're not going to be able to number all of them. And what God is getting at, eventually God does give Abraham a son. A son named Isaac. And Isaac has children. And his children have children. But the most important thing of all of this, and the New Testament tells us, that Abraham's children are those who have the same faith who believe in the same God that Abraham. So there's a little Bible verse we heard. It's a really important one, so you guys can remember this. It says, And Abraham believed in God, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So that Abraham was righteous, and Abraham himself was a son of God because he believed, because he had faith. And ultimately, not just that is Abraham our father, a father by faith, but most importantly, we said at the beginning of the creed, I believe in God the Father. Right? That we have a Father in heaven. And it's by Him that we know what our earthly fathers should also know. Right? Including Abraham and our own dads as well. So let's Let's say a prayer. Let's give thanks to God for all of our fathers and for the gifts he gives us. So dear God, thank you for being our Heavenly Father. Thank you for being our Heavenly Father. And for giving us earthly fathers. And for giving us earthly fathers. And spiritual fathers too. And spiritual fathers too. So that we may be. So that we may be. Children of Abraham, and children of God, in Jesus' name.
Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The first commandment says, You shall have no other gods. Now, every Lutheran should know exactly what that means, as spelled out in the small catechism. It's one of the easiest things that, when you're in confirmation, that you have to learn and memorize. So what does this mean? It's pretty simple. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Right? Fear, love, and trust. Those are the three big things, and they carry on throughout the explanation of all of the commandments. And while we know that, and while we hear about that and learn that, we know that while each of these have their own little nuances, they're also easier said than done, right? Because there's other things that come up that often cause us to fear more than what we would fear God. Oftentimes we find ourselves loving things in God's creation, even the gifts that our Heavenly Father has given us, more than the giver of the gifts. And today we hear and come to this idea of trust, which is related to faith and belief. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. What does that mean to trust in God above all things? So I'm going to start with Psalm 13. That was our intro this morning that we just sang. And this psalm highlights the kind of trust that the first commandment is getting. <clears throat> psalm 13 is a psalm composed by David. And while we don't know exactly the situation that David is in, it's possible that it was one of those times when he was being hunted by Saul, who was trying to kill him. Regardless, when we read this psalm, we get the impression that it's the voice of a man who's in deep distress. A man who's worried and fearful. And to make matters even worse, Regardless of what the issue is at hand, David now is complaining that in the time of his trouble, in the time of his hardship, that God himself seems indifferent. That God has maybe even forgotten all about him, despite the promises that God had previously given to David. And so he says, how long? O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? <coughs> that really highlights the issue at hand that David is getting at as well. While we don't again know exactly what the issue was that's bothering David, that's not really the focus of the psalm itself. Rather, it's what lies behind that. And where is God in all of this? And what really bothers David is his sense of loneliness, of isolation, and maybe even flat-out abandonment by other people, but specifically by God himself. And there's a very important thing, too, in looking at this psalm. Nowhere in this psalm is there an indication that this abandonment is caused by David being a sinner. Nor by any specific sin he might have committed. There's no confession of something he might have done wrong. There's no contrition, right? No feeling or sense of sorrow about this. And there is no recognition of guilt. Rather, his worry and his concern lie in his fears now that his enemies are going to succeed, that they're going to defeat them, that it is an evil plan. And in the midst of all of this, he's crying out to God, much in the same way that Job does. Say, God, I'm experiencing this. It's not my fault. You promised this on one hand. And yet now my experience seems to say and indicate something different. So how long 
Are you going to stand idly by and not do anything about the problem? And in that sense, it should probably, the problem does resonate with every single one of us. I mean, who here hasn't had that kind of feeling at times of abandonment? Or somehow maybe God is punishing me for something. And, or just why is all of this happening to me? I haven't done anything. I go to church. I pray. I read the Bible. When I do something wrong, I ask for forgiveness. And yet here I am, still suffering. So where are you, God? What's taking you so long? to do something about that situation. Especially when God doesn't seem to be living up to his end of the bargain and what he said that he would do. Now, for the psalmist, these questions very easily could have paralyzed him with fear. And sometimes it does for us. Right? Sometimes we're left so hopeless and helpless that we feel like now there's nothing we can do and God doesn't seem to be doing anything. So we just give up. What's the use? What's the care? But for David, that's not how he responds to this at all. He doesn't wallow in self-pity or despair or go through a poor me routine. Rather, it aggravates him. And maybe even makes him a little bit angry. God, how long are you going to stand by and not do anything? Don't you even care if I live or die? Now, this is not some sort of passive, aggressive virtue signaling. And it's not the cringing speech of a victim either. He doesn't beg for anything. But it actually expresses a very deep and a very abiding faith. A sense that God has now been hiding himself in the midst of trouble long enough. That David has suffered long enough. That the enemy has worked against him long enough. And in a sense then, it teaches us as well to pray in that same way. And saying sometimes it is actually okay to be angry at God. What is taking you so long? It's not fair. It's not right. Do something wrong. Veiled within all of these questions, though, is this idea and this trust in God above all things that David has that it actually matters. That he has a Father in heaven who desires to hear his prayers and engages in conversation and actually answers. And so David is caught now and he's tossed back and forth between these feelings that he matters in God's eyes, and the feeling that God has forsaken or forgotten him, that God has left him alone to suffer, maybe even stopped caring. Now, Abraham also knew this feeling, didn't he? The Old Testament reading, if we move to that, we have Abraham in a very similar situation. Years and years before, God had told him, you're going to be the father of many nations, and yet there he was, he and Sarah, still barren, unable to have children. And now he's complaining, the only person who's going to get all my inheritance isn't even a relative. It's a servant in my household, because I have nobody else to carry on my legacy, to remember my name, and for me to show my love. And what was even worse earlier now he complains to God and he says God you promised this but this is what's going on they don't match how long do I have to wait and as God had promised that Abraham would be the father of many nations and a blessing to the world 
it seems like God had just forgotten or maybe even abandoned or simply changed his mind. What child doesn't feel that way about their own father as well? Who goes off tugging on a parent's pant leg and saying, I'm hungry, when's dinner going to come? Or you're on a trip, you're driving in the car, and you have the question, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How long until we're there? And, right? And it gets aggravating for the child, if you guys can even remember. You probably did that exact thing to your mom and dad. Because you feel like you're not getting the answer you want or the answer you need. And so you keep pestering. You keep talking until maybe your mom and dad finally say, stop it. Okay? Stop asking the question I just told you five minutes ago. We're going to get there when we get there. So just suck it up and deal with it. Okay? Now that's one thing to happen in our own lives. And it's another thing, too, when we're having that kind of conversation with the Father. Just like a child is ready and able and doesn't even second guess pestering his mom and dad to try to get the answer to those questions, so, too, should we be the exact same way towards God. Are we there yet? What's taken you so long? You said we we're coming up on our destination. My dad used to always tell us, no matter where we were going, five miles or 500 miles, how long until we get there? And he'd say, just two more right turns. <laughs> it didn't matter how many turns we took. That was always the question and always the feeling. And so we passed her. And our Heavenly Father loves to hear the questions even the complaints from his children. How long until you keep your promise? Then the word of the Lord comes to Abram. It says to him in a vision, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. He's still doubtful. That's about as good as two more right turns. I still don't have any kids, he says. I still don't see the fulfillment of any of this. And besides, we're way too old. We should be grandparents right now. What could God actually give to him? And so he takes him outside and he tells him again, look up, number the stars if you can. The point he's trying to get across is that the blessings and the promises of God are even greater than Abraham could even count. Even number. And then we have it. We have this verse, in fact, one of the most important Bible verses in the Old Testament. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now this that passage right there, Genesis 15, 6, is the first passage in the Bible which we have that is specifically about faith. And in that passage, notice, there is no mention of any preparation for grace or of any faith formed through works or any kind of preceding disposition. In fact, if anything, Abraham's anger and frustration with God showed something opposite. And yet in the midst of Abraham's sins, his doubts, his fears, and his questions about the future and the future of his family, God looks at him and says, you are righteous. That's a pretty significant thing. Significant because of this. Nobody else in Scripture highlights the importance of this passage as much as Paul does in the book of Romans. In chapters 3 and in chapters 12, he quotes this verse to highlight what this actually means to God's people. 
and children of the Heavenly Father. Paul treats it in such a way that he shows that this promise concerning Abraham's descendants aren't just talking about the legitimate biological offspring, not just those that get to inherit his cows, his sheep, his property, but those who are children of Abraham by faith, by sharing the same trust in the promises of God. And it's the exact same way for us. You and I, just like Abraham, just like David, just like Moses, just like Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea and Joel and Amos and all the Old Testament people and New Testament people of God are declared righteous in the sight of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Through faith in the promises kept that find their fulfillment their center, their goal in the very Son of God, the offspring of Abraham. And so Paul writes in Romans, righteousness will be counted to us who believe in him who was raised from the dead and who's raised Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And that is the answer to God's promises. That was God's answer to Abraham, and that was God's answer to David, and that's God's answer to you. And it may seem like the basic Sunday school answer, but it's the right Jesus. How long, O oh Lord, until you come and fix this situation? How long, O oh Lord, until the sin and the evil and the bad stops? Jesus is the answer for you. In fact, Jesus himself basically cries out these same feelings, these same thoughts. He hangs upon the cross, and what does he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus knows exactly what, it like, what it's like to feel abandoned, to feel left alone, to suffer in a way that is completely unfair through no fault of his own. And yet there he was, dying upon the cross so that he might take all of the sin, all of the burden, all of the answers to the questions that you may have upon himself and simply cry out, it is finished. The answer to those questions is the, is the death and the resurrection of Jesus. A death and resurrection and then when you are baptized, God marks you as his own uniting you through the word and through the water to his death and resurrection. Do you wonder, does God actually care? Does he hear? Is he really my father? That's your answer. Jesus gives you himself. That's not enough. In a little bit, we're going to come up, and he's literally going to give you his body and his blood. Take, eat, take, drink. This is given for you so that you might know, that you might have the certainty that your sins are forgiven, that you are loved by God, that you are never forgotten, that you matter because you have the Word and the Spirit that He has sent to live in you. So it's okay to pray. How long, O oh Lord? And it's okay sometimes even to be angry and mad and bitter, even at God himself, for the sinfulness that happens in this world, while at the same time having that trust in God above all things, that his promises are fulfilled in Christ, that the Lord has and will deal bountifully with you, and while you wait, for those two more turns to come until you reach that destination. Why you wonder and you doubt and you question, 
The Word of God directs our attention up to the heavens as well. To count the blessings that are too many to record. But most important, so that you might know that God's plan is greater than what you realize. More than what you can see. And to learn to fear and love and trust in God above all things. For God's promises all find their yes in Jesus. And so may that peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds to look up to Jesus, the answer to your question. Now I invite you to please rise as we continue on in our service by presenting our offerings before the Lord and singing our offering. <clears throat> Abraham's descendants, and a, multiple, a multitude more numerous 
that even the stars of heaven who shine in the glory of His presence, may we also be heirs by faith and brought to rejoice with Him eternally before God Himself. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we implore you to rule and govern our hearts by the Holy Spirit, that we may not, like the rich man, hear your word in vain, and become so devoted to the things temporal that we forget things eternal, but that we may serve those who are in need readily and according to our ability, not defiling ourselves, but in trial and misfortune. As you keep us from despair, let us trust in your fatherly help and grace. That in trust and in Christian patience we may overcome all things. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Welcome to the 
the table of the board.
praise you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same. In faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another. For Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Thank you for joining us here this morning on this first Sunday after Trinity. 